Hi, this is Mr. Judd, and this is a picture of microscopic yeast cells. They are a unicellular fungus that reproduces by budding, and that means that they make a small copy of themselves that then breaks apart and is a free-living clone. They reproduce very quickly, and that's good for us because when added to dough, they will eat the sugars, reproduce, and produce lots of carbon dioxide that helps the dough rise. They are also useful in population studies or population ecology because they can be controlled in a laboratory. So we can control their environment or their ecosystem and we can see how their numbers grow or shrink over time. In this video clip that you're about to watch, this is a glass container that has been filled with liquid and a bunch of sugar and a few yeast. This at the top is a fermenting lock it prevents air from getting in, but it allows the carbon dioxide they produce to be released out the top. Other than the carbon dioxide being released, nothing else can get out or in. So I'm gonna play the video, which is four days of population of yeast condensed into about 30 seconds. And what you wanna see is how that population is changing over time. So if we were able to graph the number of yeast in that glass container, what would it look like? Well, here's a pretty good guess. This graph shows time along the x-axis and population on the y-axis. You'll notice that at the beginning, there wasn't much action. And in this part of the graph, the population is increasing, they're reproducing, but not very quickly. Then in the second part of the graph, from here to here, we've got an increase in their population and they're reproducing very quickly. Then at this portion of the graph, they start to level off and even get to a stable population. They're not increasing anymore. And then at the very end, you notice that the action started to die down. And that was because lots of yeast were dying and their population was going down. So when we have a population growth like this, we usually consider that there's going to be a limiting factor. So let's put that in limiting factor. Limiting factor is any condition that prevents the population from growing too large. And those can be living biotic factors or abiotic factors, non-living. When there's a limiting factor in place, there is a limit to the population. And that limit is called the carrying, carrying capacity, carrying capacity. That's the limit on the population growth due to environmental conditions. So what do you think was limiting this population of yeast? Well, we did give them food, but no more food was added. So food could have been a limiting factor. They may have been running out of food and then they were starving. Well, maybe they were producing some sort of waste. That's another limiting factor. Um, they do produce alcohol, which is a poison, and that could have poisoned their environment and killed them off. Now, what about some biotic living factors? Um, there, there could have been a predator that was running around inside of that glass container and eating them up and causing their population to be limited, or it could have been a disease that was limiting their population. Those would both be biotic limiting factors. The next situation I wanna talk about is the predator-prey relationship. We have a lynx over here and a snowshoe hare over here. The lynx is a predator of the snowshoe hare. So in the food chain, the arrow would go like this. And here's their population graph. You'll notice that the prey population, that's the snowshoe hare, is here. And the predator population is down here. At the beginning, the prey population rises. And then shortly following that, the predator population goes up. And why would that be? Well, if there are more prey, then the predator has more to eat and they can get lots of food and reproduce. So their numbers go up. Then, as there are a lot of predators in the environment, they are going to eat up all of their prey, and the prey population is going to go down. When there's less prey, there's less food for predators, and there's going to be a corresponding dip, slightly delayed, in their population. 
And this cycle happens over and over and over. It's called a predator-prey cycle. It's pretty rare that this happens this neatly in nature, but in this situation it did occur because this is a single food chain. There's no other food web, so there's no other sources of food for the lynx. The next situation I want to talk about is what a competition graph would look like. If you put two species in the same glass container, and the two species we're going to do is this species of paramecium and this species of paramecium, which are single-celled eukaryotes, and the, the population might change like this. We have one population that is rising and rising and rising and then reaching some sort of carrying capacity. And the other population, the blue line, seems to go up and then it goes down to zero. This population is locally extinct, it goes to zero. So who's winning the competition? Clearly this paramecium population is winning the competition. Now you'll never see a predator prey population do this because if say this was the, uh, this was the predator population or the prey population and the prey population went down to zero, the prey, the predators would also have to go down to zero because they would have no food left. Now the one last situation I want to talk about is uh, one that's more familiar with you. At last check, our human population was just over 7 billion. Now if we look at our human population over a long period of time, um, thousands of years, for thousands of years our population was relatively stable. And it's just within the last few hundred years that our population has risen all the way up from under 1 billion to over 7 billion people here on Earth. So I want you to think of the biosphere, our Earth, as like that glass container. It's pretty much closed. We have an input of sun, we have some, uh, some release of heat, but mostly it's just a closed system. So what do you think the next step is? Well, I hope, for your sake and mine, that it is not the same as the yeast population, that there's going to be a crash. But that is possible. If conditions do change, then the population can rise up. But this is just food for thought in population ecology, and I hope that was helpful.